Prince and members of his team. Um, I, think, I don't think I will attempt to call the names of the others. So he's leading the team. So on behalf of the Ministry of Infrastructure, Communications, Utilities, Housing, and Tourism, it is indeed a pleasure to welcome you to the launch of the Rizembid project, streamlining Anguilla's energy sector towards a more sustainable future. Now, this project uh, aims to support future renewable energy development in Anguilla. And I believe a project like this is long overdue. Um, Anguilla is blessed with abundant sunshine, abundant wind, and waves um, energy. So the source of um, energy is almost infinite. And we have an opportunity now to tap into it and to reduce our continued dependence on fossil fuel, which is not sustainable. So we embrace this program and we look forward to the full participation of not only our major stakeholders, but the public in general. And the team will be you know, soliciting um, help, advice, consultation throughout the duration of this project, and we will hear more from the um, project coordinator. So without further ado, because this ceremony um, should not take more than, I think, maybe half an hour or thereabout, but it depends on the speakers. So at this time, that's a notice. I will welcome um, for a project, project overview, uh, Mr. Travis Carter, Carty, who is the Director of Public Utilities and Minister of Infrastructure, and he's also one of the project um, coordinators. So this time I will invite him to come and give us a project overview. Yeah, give him a hand as he comes. Ladies and gentlemen, a pleasant good morning. I wish to adopt the protocol already established and welcome you all to this distinguished event this morning, the launch of our Angola Renewable Energy Program that will be affectionately known as AREP, plugging into the future. Permit me for a minute to take you on a journey with me, back, way back, back in time. One of the things I believe that we have to understand our past in order to know where we are and how we got here. Ladies and gentlemen, history has shown that energy has transitioned from one source to another before, since the, the Industrial Revolution. In that era, the reliance was on sunlight in the day to keep warm and burned wood at night. In Angola, we still have the coal key. In the first transition, wood was replaced by coals. Also in that era, we had the muscle of the horses to pull the carriage, the wind in our sails, in the sails to move the, boat, the vessels. Ladies and gentlemen, the second transition from fossil fuel oils replaced coals. And I'm here this morning to have the distinct honor of presenting to you an overview of the resin bed project title, Streaming Angola's Energy Sector Towards a More Sustainable Future. The project aims to establish a foundation that will support future renew renewable energy development in Angola. I must acknowledge Director Mr. Jeremy Pillay and his team. Thank you for being with us and being here this morning. Special good morning to the Honorable Premier and Honorable Ministers of Government. And special acknowledgement to my colleagues from the Albina Lake Arts Comprehensive School, Solar City folks who demonstrated exactly some of the outcomes of our project. So let's give them a hand, please. So to support future, uh, future renewable energy development in Angola, one, we'll be improving public knowledge awareness, attitudes, and perceptions towards energy efficiency and renewable energy. We will strengthen in this institutional capacities and competencies to lead the energy transition and develop proof of concept activities to inspire increased uptake of energy efficiency, renewable energy, and energy efficiency technologies such as electric vehicles in Angola. As such, colleagues, this project will have three main outputs. One, an integrated resource and resilience plan 
This plan will be a product of a series of meetings with stakeholder engagements and research studies to inform Anguilla's current status and identify the most viable options to progress our energy transition. The recommendation will thus be used to update our current policies and governance practice in the energy sector. A green block, too. We all know, seeing is believing, as demonstrated by my, my good colleagues here at Solar City, I was really impressed with that project, and I, that's why they're here, and I could let them know now that I'm going to keep you guys, Mr. Barrett and your team, fully engaged throughout the duration of this project. So thank you for that. The green block will consist of tangible outputs, such as an electric vehicle charging station, retrofitted buildings with more efficient air-conditioned units and lights, and an electric vehicle charging station. This will demonstrate the benefits of renewable technologies and energy efficiency practices right here in Angola. Three, capacity building. To ensure sustainability and continuity of our Angola, of our Angola Renewable Energy Program, training of various stakeholders across the public and private sector will be fundamental. This component, ladies and gentlemen, will include training in entry level and advanced solar design and installation, level one and level two, energy audit and energy efficiency, renewable energy financing, advanced renewable energy financing, and electric vehicle technician training. Notably, this project is not to be considered just a project with a bounded timeline. The tangible outputs have led to the fruition and implementation of the Angola Renewable Energy Program, AREP, plugging into the future, and it, it, its mindset that the government of Angola will continue to drive towards transforming our energy sector from the individual households to public spaces and the commercial complexes. I am happy to be here this morning sharing with you as the Honorable Minister of Infrastructure and Honorable Minister of Sustainability in Innovation and Environment <laughs> Has committed, has committed to seeing this transition through and leading the way. So thank you, Honorable Ministers, for your support, your unenviable support through this program thus far. And I anticipate, anticipate there will be many more to come. Mike Wanti, DOI, and the Resident Bin Project team, in collaboration with the Ministry of Sustainability and Michael, we look forward to working with our key stakeholders, Anglic, the general public, the ACC, the Department of Education. So all, we, all of us will embark on this journey of transition and grow together. We will move from conditional, conventional energy sources to renewable energy technologies and more efficient practices. Angola, we are in for a raid. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Mr. Carty, for the detailed um, project overview. And just to let us know that the Resembed project um, is funded by the um, European Union Initiative implemented by Development Cooperation Agency of the Government of France. And I think similar initi initiative is being done in other overseas territories and countries. So we look forward to this journey, not just the ride, but the journey, and that we will have a pleasant destination Okay, so at this time, I'm going to invite for brief remarks, brief remarks. The Honorable Minister of Infrastructure, Communications, Utilities, Housing, and Tourism, Mr. Hayden Hughes. Give him a hand as he comes. By now, he should know that brief and remarks and my name don't go together. <laughs> Be that as it may, I'll try to make it as brief as possible. Thank you, Mr. Betty. A good morning, and I wish to adopt the protocol already established. Special good morning to our visiting guest, Mr. Jeremy Pelé, Director General expertise, friends, and his team. Welcome. In the words of Roy Cooper, governor of North Carolina, a strong renewable energy industry is good for our environment and for our economy. 
I am pleased to be here this morning to launch our Resembid project, streamlining Anguilla's energy sector towards a more sustainable future. As a minister responsible for infrastructure, public utilities, transport, and tourism, I have seen the demand for energy security increase over the years. Notably, energy is at the core of our operations. Therefore, to meet our growing demands in the various subsidiary sectors, we must continue to progress Anguilla's transition to a more sustainable energy sector. This is even more important as we continue to build our resilience to the impacts of associated climate change. The consistent increase in the cost of traditional energy is motivation enough for us to transition soonest. This administration, led by Dr. Ellis Lorenzo Webster, has already granted tax concessions for hybrid and electric vehicles. We are keen on transitioning the entire energy sector, and this will take all the will and fortitude we can muster, but we are up to the task. This administration has never shielded away from making tough decisions for the benefit of our environment, our economy, and most importantly, our people. It is therefore our duty to ensure that as a government, with the ambition to develop sustainably, we must embrace renewable energy technologies to meet the needs of the present without compromising the needs and well-being of future generations. And we must do so now, not tomorrow, not in a phase approach, but in a holistic manner that will have an immediate noticeable impact. It is no secret that Anguilla is no front runner when it comes to transitioning to renewable energy technologies. Be that as it may, I am proud today with the birth of the Anguilla Renewable Energy Program, AREP, that the change that can't wait is becoming visible. We are definitely plugging into the future. The journey towards renewable energy in Anguilla is always easy and is no different from the rest of the free world. It is fraught with politics and posturing, but we are not afraid to stand up for what is right for our people. And this has brought us here today to progress our transition to renewable energy technologies and increase efficiency practices. As such, the government of Anguilla, my QNT, will no longer be an observer in energy transition. We will take the lead and we will deliver. We will be guided by the outputs of this project, particularly the Integrated Resource Resilience Plan and grid tie studies. Through this, we will ensure that we deliver on recommended policies which puts the people of Anguilla and the environment first. My promise to you as Minister of Infrastructure, Communications, Utilities, Housing and Tourism will be to continue to support and strengthen this transition in all ways possible. The Honorable Minister of Sustainability, Mrs. Quincia Gums Marie, knows that we are in the same boat and our goals are one and the same. The outcomes and goals of this project will align Anguilla with achieving the targets of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal number seven, goals we discuss and debated during the election campaign and goals we seek to deliver upon. We will ensure access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all. One of man's most noteworthy discoveries has been the ability to transition from sole reliance on what they dubbed fossil fuels to a more sustainable and cleaner source of energy. This is because of the immeasurable impacts that energy has on so many facets of our lives. Sustainable energy and renewable energy have been trending and advocated by many persons over the past few years in Anguilla. I would like to take the opportunity to thank those persons for their invaluable contribution in both the public and private sectors. Thanks to the European Union, to the Resembid Program and Expertise France for the opportunity afforded to the government of Anguilla, my QNT in financing this project. I must also extend a hearty thank you to Mr. Travis Carty for his drive and passion to see this through. And to my PS and the team at Myco and T and DOI and the Resembit project team for the work done to bring this renewable energy program, AREP, to fruition. 
And as I close, I want to leave you with these three words. Change can't wait. I thank you. Thank you, Minister. That was, that was brief. Thank you. Well, those of us who are wondering what the acronym RESIMBID um, stands for, it is Resilience, Sustainable Energy, and Marine Biodiversity. Just to make sure that everybody understands the meaning when we use it. At this time, I'm going to call on Mr. Michael Vance, Project Manager, Sustainable Energy Project, to give brief remarks. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Michael Vance. I'm principal with Asante Energy, a consulting engineering firm uh, focused on helping utilities and governments throughout the Caribbean reach their sustainable energy targets. Uh, six years ago, my very first project was here in Anguilla on the Ground Mount Solar Project. So it's exciting to be back and exciting to be back in this refresh of the renewable energy programs. Um, the since that time, I've had the opportunity to work with the majority of the islands, uh, utilities, and governments in the Eastern Caribbean, and have uh, participated in many megawatts of, uh, of solar and battery storage. And this here has been long coming, and, it, and it's good to be back in Anguilla. Um, climate change is real. Um, those of us who live in the Caribbean, I'm proud to say that we, Caribbean is not my home. I, I live in Turks and Caicos. Uh, those of us who live in the Caribbean are most heavily impacted by its effects. So the Anguilla government bringing about this through the assistance of the European uh, Union and Expertise France is going to make some real monumental and positive impacts in the life of all Anguillans. So i um, excited to be part of the project. i excited to be working with uh, Mr. Cardi and the team. And I'm sure we'll be seeing much more of each other. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vance. OK, we go straight on. At this time, I'm calling uh, Mr. Jeremy Pallet, Director General, Expertise France, to give us some brief remarks. Honorable Premier, Honorable Ministers, Ladies and gentlemen, all protocol observed. Now, first of all, on behalf of Expertise France, the French and European Technical Cooperation Agency, active in uh, more than 100 countries, I'd like to extend my gratitude to the government of Anguilla and to the Ministry of Infrastructures, Communications, Utilities and Housing, inviting us to the launch of the project streamlining Anguilla's energy sector towards a more sustainable future. And, and thank you once again, Honorable Premier, for, for your support. This very essential project will ensure greater integration of renewable energy and energy efficiency in the electricity and transportation sectors in Anguilla. This will be highly strategic achievements. It is indeed heartening to hear about Anguilla's high renewable energy potential. I know, I know that the government is building on this opportunity by strengthening its energy policy framework that promotes renewable energy integration. So in that regard, the, 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 this, uh, this project is set to accelerate Anguilla's transition from a fossil fuel-based economy to one powered by clean ed energy solutions. And we've been discussing with you, uh, Honorable Premier, on your objective of uh, reaching 100% renewable energy for, 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 for Anguilla in the, in the future. The conversion will undoubtedly infuse the energy sector with systems that are able to survive, to adapt, and grow enabling it to better respond to any disruptions that may occur. Thanks to meaningful initiatives like this one, the people 
of Angola can expect improved access to modern, affordable, and reliable energy services. They can expect more energy security and mitigation of negative externalities of the energy system by promoting renewable energy and energy efficiency. So be sure that Expertise France and all his team, uh, Fabien McKinnon is here, Nicolas Chenet, and all the team are proud to support the government of Anguilla's efforts and commitment in the sustainable green energy transition through the Resumbid project that will have tangible and long-lasting benefits for the inhabitants of Anguilla. So moving forward and in closing, I wish the government of Anguilla all the success in its continuing updating and implementation of its national energy policy. We are confident in the adequate use of the Resenbit program and the funds made available by the European Union to make a substantive, a substantive impact on its people. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention and congratulations again on this achievement. Thank you, Mr. Pelé. Um, one of the things I'm looking forward to um, in this project is the collaboration with our electricity supply on the island. And it is my hope that we have full participation of not just a, cross, a part of the Angola population, but full participation by everyone, and especially key stakeholders. And Anglic being one of those key stakeholders. Um, so we look forward to the time when we will be able to fully integrate um, solar that is produced on rooftops so that we can have um, reduction in our energy costs. Because that's one of the only ways we're going to see sustainable and resilience, sustainability and resilience if we uh, move away from the fossil fuel. And I'm being very intentional in emphasizing this because for so long, for decades now, we have talked about renewable energy integration, but now we are seeing some tangible efforts, and I'm hoping that, as I said earlier, that the destination will end where we see actual outputs of renewable energy, and we see resilience and sustainability in action. At this time, I'm going to call on the Honorable Premier to give some free, brief remarks. Thank you. Give my hand. Adopting the protocol already established, good morning. Uh, today I take this opportunity to officially extend a warm welcome to our visitors. Uh, uh, Resembed Program Director, Mr. Fabian McKinnon, uh, Director of Expertise uh, France, Mr. Nicolas Chenet, and Director General, Mr. Jeremy Pelé. Uh, we had a pleasant uh, meeting this morning, and certainly uh, I appreciate that someone at the level of uh, the Director General would come to Anguilla for the launch of this project. It shows the commitment uh, of Expertise France. It shows that this is an important project, not only for Anguilla, but for the region. It shows that the expertise that we will benefit from is essential to Anguilla's uh, survival and its thriving. Uh, it is these types of partnerships providing technical expertise and funding which contribute to Anguilla's sustainable development. I express gratitude in the first instance for the mechanism of the European, De European Development Fund, the EDF, and that has allowed us to cooperate and benefit as OCTs, but also for the approach that has been taken in the programming phase. This is most commendable. It's a pleasure to be part of the next step in the rollout of the Resembit programs. These project launches are a true indicator that we are entering the full stages of implementation, which is the most dynamic stage. I certainly was impressed with uh, Mr. Travis Cardi's uh, presentation today to show that the level of commitment that there is to this project and the acting PS, uh, Mr. Batik. 
for your statements on wanting to see this project implemented, but then carried on into full action so that we can get, as uh, the Director General stated, um, my comments are we need to have 100% transition to renewable energy. This program epitomizes the principles of being demand-led, country-led, and responsive to our most pressing needs across the focal areas. The hands-on hands support and training for project planning and management, and the efforts to create fora for the OCTs to exchange ideas and share experiences is both thoughtful and enlightening. It is very clear that at every stage you are employing all the mechanisms to ensure the success and sustainability of each individual project. And I certainly know that some of these projects have been implemented elsewhere, uh, this project and the others which we have been so uh, happy to benefit from. Today the spotlight is on the Sustainable Energy Program. The Minister said, plugging into the future. I certainly want to see the day when uh, you know, we'll be just relying on sun or wind or both. And certainly this setting would have looked good if we didn't have to plug into the, you know, the fossil fuel generated electricity. Applaud the Ministry of Infrastructure and Department of Natural Resources for such a timely and well thought out initiative. To all those involved, both past and present, a hearty thank you. It is a source of immense pride to hear the high regard in which Anguilla's Resimbit program and the local teams are held in the region. And we look forward to reaping the benefits of more sustainable and energy efficient approaches going forward. So, on behalf of the government of Anguilla, I want to thank everyone from Expertise France, those from the EU, the EDF, for seeing the need to continue to support us even though the EU exit happened. Unfortunately. <laughs> that may be political. <laughs> but uh, I want to thank um, you know, all the departments, public servants, and everyone who has contributed and will contribute to this uh, program and other resembled programs that we continue to see Anguilla modernize and have sustainable development. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Premier. At this time, I will call on Mr. Darlene Connor, who is the project coordinator from the Ministry of Sustainability, Innovation, and the Environment, to give closing remarks and vote of thanks. Thank you, Chair. Um, distinguished guests, um, good morning. Um, I would like to share a simple quote by Kevin Keller. It reads, alone we can do so little, together we can do so much. Energy dependence is a dream that we have been pursuing for decades. It is one of the foundation pillars to our vision for providing economic stability. Within the project time frame, the outputs, the outcomes will be not only built a bond for the public and private sectors, but also transform much needed legislation, policies, frameworks, and enable energy transition across multiple sectors towards energy independence. So today, on behalf of the project steering team, I would like to thank the panel, the Honorable Premier, um, Dr. Lorenzo Webster, the Honorable Minister of Infrastructure, Mr. Hayden Hughes, Expertise France General, Dr. Director General, Mr. Jamie Pelle, Project Manager, uh, Mr. Michael Vance, the 
Pastor Mr. Cecil Richardson and the project coordinator Mr. Travis Scotty. We will extend a heartfelt thank you for recognizing the importance of this project and the transition of energy independence and for the time taken to deliver brief remarks and much welcome presentations. I would like, also like to thank the Rizumbit for the support for this timely program. We are sure that in the coming months, experience, export knowledge, insight on energy efficiency, renewable energy is a valuable contribution to the Anguilla and its people. I would like to thank the media for the continuous showing their support over the years and informing the public about key topics that influence the island and the region on engine related matters. Now more than ever, we are looking for your continuous support throughout this transition phase. I would like to thank the project team for the resilience work uh, be behind the scenes. And I look forward to continue to work with all the key stakeholders um, in the future. I would like to make special uh, mention to the late um, Calvin Andre Samuel for his stellar contribution in this development of this project concept. And we will honor his memory by seeing through this quest for energy independence. To Rocky Hill Institute, I thank you for helping us to articulate this vision. To the Honorable Quincia um, Mary Gums, thank you for the consistent recognition for the challenges faced. For you, your role is an advocate and a champion in the task ahead. Finally, I would like to thank C. Blue for the opportunity to use the facilities to conduct this project launch and today's events. And in closing, I am conf confident that with a consultative effort from the government of Angola, Angol Anglic, the private stakeholders, and our people, um, and the coordinated support from the international development community, our dream is being an energy independent nation in the Caribbean will soon come true. I am also personally proud to be part of a contrib team contributing the realization of the energy independent Angola. I'd like to thank everyone. Thank you. I think that's it for now, but the beach is there calling. So, <laughs> so ready. I hope you I hope you walk with your, your bathing suits and you're ready to go. <laughs> okay, so uh, thank you um, everyone for coming and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Um, yeah, we're going to do that. Now, just to make mention, um, we have, everyone, two seconds, uh, with that after. Uh, just to make mention, we have uh, the Solar City display is in the room there. Uh, I'd appreciate if you guys take a look uh, at the students' um, demonstration of the green black. Yeah, we're taking a group picture now.
that you trust me today. Lord, thank you, Pete, for today. Some of it has to make policy. A lot of the policies you can take a look at those things and make sure about the regulations that are good there. Uh, and we feel that <laughs> the best way to do that is to have 100% renewable super as possible, whether it's solar, wind, solar, and wind, uh, you know, rain, what, whatever it takes to get us there. And we have always uh, postulated that the best way to do that in our general context because of our fiscal uh, situation and our constitutional situation is that we go ahead and get an industrial developer through an RFP or a purchase appraisal uh, so that if we go through procurement, we get a uh, developer to develop the, uh, the farm, the uh, energy farm, and then distribute through Anglex with the power purchase agreement. That will get us there quickly. The proposal by Anglex is to do it in a phased approach and also to get funding that government hasn't focused down to that funding. That is, uh, government guarantee funding requires that the UK, our administering power, would have to give permission for that. And at this point in time, there is there is no uh, real impetus for the UK to allow us to guarantee loans uh, by Anglic to do this. So, so this program today that we just launched will help us towards uh, legislation, such as grid tie legislation, such as um, integration into, uh, you know, we're into where they have a distributed um, solar uh, where rooftops, and then you can uh, develop energy for yourself, but also then it goes back into the grid, and that can reduce the cost of electricity. Uh, so that's one of the things that we've done. We will go to more energy efficient uh, techniques, and that would also help to reduce the use of energy, and that should also decrease the cost of electricity, which is, I think, one of the major um, causes of the um, increased cost of living in Anguilla. And uh, so this is the first step in that direction. We want to get Anglic on board. We want to make sure that Anglic buys into this because, um, you know, as you know, the government is responsible for 79% of the shares of Anglic. And we feel that uh, given the right direction, all of us want the same goal, to have um, energy efficiency, to have green energy, to decrease the cost of living in Anguilla, and we have to get on the same page. When was the last time there were any discussions between Anglic and the government of Anguilla as it relates to this whole energy, and renewable energy program or project? Um, it's, it's been over three months that we've had um, discussions. Certainly, um, I have had discussions with the Caribbean Development Bank. I know that Anglec is, dis is having discussions with Caribbean Development Bank. Um, I don't know where, they, um, wh where it is with them. I do know that um, in our discussions with Caribbean Development Bank, it requires government um, sign on and buy in. And we have stated the position that we cannot give a guarantee of a loan for Anglec without getting the UK to approve. And at this point in time, the UK does not have any uh, stomach to approve. That. So certainly when the uh, CDB president was here recently, that uh, those discussions featured prominently, the whole renewable energy program featured prominently in, in those discussions, because he yes, only met with the government, he did not meet with Anglic. And that's usual for the CDB president when he visits a country to meet uh, with government. He also met with the Excellency the Governor. Um, we talked about uh, national strategic development plans because, you know, Caribbean Development Bank is here to help countries develop through concessionary uh, funding and also to give technical advice. And so those are the discussions we had and uh, certainly renewable energy is one of those because that is one of the pillars now for the OECS, for the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, for the CDB, to have our islands move towards uh, renewable energy, whether in part or in whole. Premier, another issue of major interest, we had uh, the total loss of telecommunications uh, internet services uh, last Saturday, uh, restored, thankfully, uh, on Monday afternoon. Certainly this must be of major concern without any backups at the time by either telecom um, uh, companies. Uh, major concern for businesses and for everyone, the entire country. And I'm sure this would have drawn
your attention that of the governor, and in fact, that of the National Security Council. What can you share with the Anguillan public at this time that something will, like this will never happen again? And what about government's own contingency plans uh, for such a, a, a situation? Certainly, yeah. so, Keith, you know, that was uh, a very disturbing uh, event. Uh, and we do know, um, as has been publicized, that um, one or more ships anchored uh, near the, um, the, on the water line uh, caused damage to it. Uh, and that put us all out. The backup system, which is usually through French Saint-Martin, uh, that also went down at the time. And so we were left in blackout um, in terms of telecommunications. And um, the Minister for Infrastructure, um, he has um, stated in the House of Assembly yesterday that he has asked his team to make sure that there are re enough redundancy so there's backup in case something like this, God forbid, would happen again. Uh, certainly I've had discussions with the Excellency of the Governor, who has been in touch with the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office to make sure that there are contingency plans um, and, and also the ability for backup in case uh, this was to happen. So that, you know, at least emergency services, government services, and um, essential services are still online, um, in, even if this was to happen. Okay, let's move to another subject. Um, water, another critical resource. I understand um, that there could be, uh, Anglet could be, uh, maybe take some action again uh, to turn the, the, the electricity off for the water um, plant uh, with, over its uh, continued non payment of that outstanding sum. Uh, if this is true, are there any backup plans by the Water Corporation to continue supplying water to its customers? Uh, certainly, Keith, uh, the, uh, we do know that uh, the issue with water is that there was an outstanding bill by the Water Corporation of Anglic to Anglic that has been there for many years. Um, it has continued to accrue. Um, Anglic has, um, you know, filed lawsuit against the Water Corporation of Anguilla. And, and now, recently, Anglec has sent a letter with a copy to me saying that uh, by next week they will turn off water again if they're not paid the difference that has accrued between when they started the lawsuit to now. Um, you know, water does have a generator, and so the plan would be, in the short term, if uh, Anglic does turn off the electricity of the water, that we would start using the uh, generator again, providing the diesel uh, to keep the generator going. Um, but this is not a long-term fix. What we need to do is to be able to have um, Anglic and water work out the pl a plan of payment. And we had proposed that as government, Keith. We had proposed uh, a payment plan to Anglec where we pay them some of the money up front and then we guaranteed that whatever water corporation on its monthly basis, whatever they could not meet, that the government would meet the difference. And I think that that, given our fiscal space, was a good plan and would have helped to mitigate against any accrual of arrears um, other than what was there before and then there could be a pay down and uh, worked out. Um, Anglec refused uh, to accept that proposal from government and so here we are, still water in jeopardy. Water is an essential service and we want to make sure that we can get to a point where we don't have to be worrying about uh, these things or that we can provide water or that the electricity, uh, the lights are on all the time. I imagine that when the UK Overseas Territories Minister was here, Lord Olson, recently, the water situation would have been one of the key points that you would have raised, the government would have raised with you. Am I correct? Y you are very correct. And one of the important uh, top priority uh, was water. And uh, because we do know that the water network, uh, it's leaking. About 80% of the water produced, which we are paying for, is leaking into the ground. And so we discussed uh, getting a fulsome survey done to see the uh, extent of the, of the uh, problem, and then to get funding to help us to replace that network. And uh, Lord Zach Goldsmith, the Minister for the Overseas Territory, was uh, you know very helpful in terms of his understanding of the problem and in terms of suggesting ways forward. And so over the next uh, few months, we'll be discussing the ways that we can uh, mitigate 
against this and try to get water back to where where it's sustainable. Because right now it's not sustainable to be producing uh, water that we are paying a heavy price for uh, through the desalination plant, uh, through the brackish water plant, and then it's just being pumped into the ground because the pipe network is leaking. We also can't get on the network um, over 2,000 customers that want to get on, but because uh, we don't have the ability to get the water to them. And so these things we have to make up. I understand too that the government uh, in discussions with uh, Lord Bruce uh, Smith also sought to get some additional capital, some additional funding for the airport redevelopment project. Is, is that so? Uh, are you? Uh, yeah, I mean, and, and I, I other can, funding for other projects. Yes, too. certainly, certainly. Uh, one of the things uh, which um, you're alluding to is we wanted to make sure that the commitment of the four million pounds each year for three years that that was solid. And uh, with the change in minister, with the change in prime ministers, with the uh, change in treasury, um, you know, it, we wanted to make sure uh, the change in the foreign secretary. And so we got a commitment from Lord Goldsmith that um, the other eight million that is left. On, uh, for the Angola Economic Resiliency uh, Plan, that that would be sure. So we would get that. The other thing we talked about was airport uh, development. And there's the airport master plan, which was done. And it shows that if we build a new terminal and expand the runway, that over the next uh, 20 years, that we can have over $200 million in economic growth in England. I mean, you're putting out X number of millions of dollars and the return on it is three to four times. I mean, th that is a no-brainer. So I've always said that airport and development is the number one priority economic resilient program in Angola. And we've committed that 12 million pounds to that we will get the uh, the taxiway, we'll get the customs warehouse moved, we'll get um, a, a, the new terminal building, and then we have to find funding for expansion of the runway. And that's what we discussed. And again, we had uh, some very innovative uh, ways that we could come up with that, whether it's uh, gonna be the UK that will be uh, you know, contributing to it, or we find uh, the financing and get permission to borrow. Because remember, we're outside our borrowing guidelines in two of the three uh, categories. Uh, we do have reserves, of course, that meet the 25% uh, or three-month recurrent expenditure uh, level. But in terms of our borrowing guidelines for uh, how much we can borrow, we're way above the threshold for that, which is 80% of our recurrent revenue and um, the debt servicing of less than 10% of recurrent revenue. But those we are over. So you're over your borrowing guidelines uh, as per the agreement with the British. That's uh, right. So have you asked for further deferral, further delay in when that comes back, when you expect it to get that back in line? Well, we expect to get that uh, back in line by 2030. Uh, so we still actually, by the way, uh, when we do the projections, we're still looking at about 2028, 2029. We should be able to hit that. However, if we have to borrow the money to expand the airport uh, runway, then that's added on. If we have to borrow money to improve the water network, that is added on. So, of course, uh, we've been having those discussions that if that comes where we have to uh, borrow, then we'd extend those, get an extension on those deadlines. And how confident are you that the British would be amenable to that proposal to give you some further breathing space? Uh, Keith, I think that the British understand that when this administration came in, that we were willing to honor uh, formal agreements that were made by previous administrations. And that is important. I always um, see that if a government has signed an agreement, that you have to honor that agreement. It's just like the Paris Accords, unless you want to be like Trump and just break them off or, you know, you break off um, any agreements um, and uh, treaties that were done. Uh, I don't think that's good governance. And so the British government, the FCDO, understands that this administration uh, will honor any agreements that were made. And I think that does give us that uh, trust and confidence uh, with them that they will be willing to work with us. Premier, let's get to a very controversial issue. Uh, it's still before your cabinet. I know you plan to take it out for consultation. 
gaming, casino gambling, uh, a standalone facility here in Anguilla, somewhere in Anguilla uh, that will be facilitating uh, guests coming to Anguilla at uh, most of the major resorts and villas and so on. What is the very latest situation on this? Uh, and how far has the government gone, gone in putting in this gaming casino gambling initiative? So, Keith, uh, when we came in, gaming uh, was part of the medium-term ec economic and fiscal plan. That is a plan where every uh, that is done every year for the upcoming three years. And that was included. We call it the MTEP. And um, I feel, looking at the consultations that were done in 2019, that this is a good way to increase um, our economic um, outturn to get recurrent revenue into Anguilla. Uh, because we can determine what the um, taxes are on that, what the returns um, should be to government from the profits that are made. And um, we can control also um, who is allowed to gamble. And so my goal has always been, we want to restrict the local population as much as possible uh, from gambling because we understand that gambling can have deleterious effects. Uh, so this would be set up standalone because we don't want every hotel saying that if one gets it, that all have to get it because there's a favored nation clauses in all the MOUs. So it will be standalone. And, and then it will be membership only. And, and, and this for high-end um, gambling. And, and, and that's where it can be controlled. And so I know that there are concerns out there in the public. Um, I've heard that you had the uh, ministers of the gospel on and they had concerns. Certainly I understand those concerns, but we already have gambling in the society, in the lotteries, um, whether legal or illegal. We have bingo, we have other um, raffles and things like that. So in itself, we already are introduced that. The level of casino gambling can be controlled. And so far, Keith, we have the, uh, the gaming policy. We have uh, draft legislation. The gaming um, you know, policy um, will be discussed in cabinet so that all the ministers uh, can have a look at it. Then it will come out to public consultation. It will go to executive council, of course, before that, uh, come out to public consultation. Then um, any ratifications will be done, and then it will be going to the House. Speak to us about how the licensing will, will work. So there'll be just a, a single license granted by the government yeah. of Angola and the revenue you're expecting. Um, well, we haven't set from it. We haven't set the limit yet on licenses, but I anticipate them that you know we'll do maybe one or two, um, you know, start with, because we don't want to have a gambling um, center on every corner or near to schools or churches and things like that. And uh, that would not be the type of gambling that I want to see in Anguilla. Certainly, um, you know, it has to be very controlled and very restricted. Yeah, but you already have that to some extent with the lotteries that are spread from east to west. Understand. Um, I'm just saying at that level, we'll control it. They'll be high end. It will be, uh, you know, similar to what you see in like uh, Monte Carlo and things like that, uh, you know. But we, we, have, we have other... Um, jurisdictions that we have looked at their gambling and, and, and the, the legislation. We've looked at St. Martin, we looked at St. and uh, we've um, gotten uh, legislation from other jurisdictions uh, and we are tailoring it to suit what Anguilla will benefit from without necessarily having wide exposure. And you think if this project gets off, you can bring in significant revenue into the coffers of Definitely the Definitely, Keith. And I mean, and the goal is that if we can bring in revenue that is not necessarily coming out of the pockets of the local person, then we can reduce some of the taxes that local people have to pay. We can reduce property tax. We can, you know, consider bringing down the GST rate if, if that is feasible. I mean, I don't want people to run off now and print in the paper that I said we're bringing down the GST rate. <laughs> we certainly want them to print. We're not going to carry it up. But, but, but uh, you know, these are, you know, Keith, what, what, what is so funny is, uh, you know, we were at the Vivian Vanderpool Primary School last week, and, you know, we were, we got um, some funding from Ani Private Resort uh, to build a ICT lab, the computer lab at the school. 
but that lab that there is currently is attached to two classrooms which are right next to the sea and there is um, you know concerns there so you know the teachers and students would like to have the two classrooms moved also with that uh, YC block so government had to come up with the funding for that you're not going to get that from anywhere we can't ask the UK to give us um, the million dollars EC that is needed to add to the money from Honey Villas to get um, those uh, two classrooms so we were able to come up with that funding 950,000 EC dollars to add to what we got from Ani Villas to do that but where did that money come from that money had to we can only project that revenue based on the GST the goods and service tax and we can say because it is a predictable um, amount of revenue that we're going to get we can say we can commit to this program to build and that's how it is going forward the um, health care for those 70 years and older we're just about at that level where we can implement it that also um, paid for the almost seven million dollars that we've committed to that we can only do that confidently uh, by because of the returns that we've gotten from the goods and service tax uh, you know so so the the increments and the progressions that we're working on right now and uh, and that will soon be coming I know people have been saying it's delayed yes but it will be retroactive to January 1st and when it does happen and so so the, the deputy governor did speak about it and we will get that um, in, in short order and uh, to help you know, public servants who've been there, who've not had a raise in, you know, over 12 years. And we want to make sure that they have and that opportunity to advance as they should be. As you know, Doc Webster, all politics is local. And uh, you mentioned the Vivian Vanderpool Primary School. I understand your students and teachers, they are having some issues at right now with the sagas and the smell. And um, I've seen posts on, on uh, social media where they're appealing for help for persons to clear uh, that sarcasm, even though it's been suggested that it's because of the prevailing wind condition at the time that is bringing that stuff on. But what has been done, or you know, anything? That's your area. That's, yes, so I said all politics is definitely. Is what has been and done? It, it, it is unfortunate that the first approach taken by some of the um, community is that they should protest and block the roads to the school. That is not the way you deal with these situations. You know, sarcasm is something that we have no control over. And, and if you go up there, keep, and this, when we were there last week, when we were groundbreaking, you know, you could see how thick the sargassum is and how far out to sea it is, and it's come, still coming in. So if you go and you clean it up now, by half day, it's going to be back up and, and, and where it was. So I would just ask, um, you know, the community, the students, the teachers, to exercise some patience and some tolerance and understanding. You know, the Webster sisters, uh, Gwinnett, uh, uh, Johnson, Colin Johnson, those who live right there, they have been cleaning the beach uh, voluntarily for the past few years. And uh, um, Ed Mead Smith and others who contribute their time and effort to keep the beach clean. Now they have been overwhelmed. And they don't get paid for this case. I want to emphasize that because we saw on social media people were saying that people who are getting paid should go and clean it. They don't get paid. They've done it because of good community spirit. Exercise some patience. Let's um, you know, deal with it in a manner where um, we can get it um, moved as much as possible. The whole community, community can pitch in. Um, so, so that's what we, we are now working, the ministry and the minister in my coup and others, the minister of education. We have been discussing this of how we can uh, reduce the amount that there is to reduce the smell and the effects on the students and teachers. Um, but understand, this is a natural occurrence right now. We got to work through it, but we can't make it political. And that seems to be the first place where it was taken. And certainly, Keith, we cannot, that is not acceptable. We care about the students, we care about the teachers, we care about the school. I like the location of the school. You know, they were members of the previous administration who wanted to close the school and move the students to the new Morris Vanderpool Primary School. I said when I came in that this will not happen under my watch. I've been ridiculed for that um, in the public service, but that is it. That's a school that, um, I went to both schools, the East End and Island Harbor, 
but this is in my neighborhood, and this school has served the purpose of educating some of the brightest students in Anguilla. And certainly that legacy has to stand. So I am there to support the school, and let's work together to deal with these situations as they come up. Let's look at some projects now on the Premier. The Ultima Marina project. Um, I understand that's ready to go. Where are we on that? And we are, Ultima Marina project, certainly uh, we have an MOU for it, or an MOA, because it was uh, 2006, then it was revised in 2016, and then um, in 2022, um, we, uh, 2021, we came up with um, a new MOA. Uh, the, the principals are here now uh, to do the marina. Um, I met with them last week. And we they have some revisions to the MOA, nothing major. And they are committed to a social project. Uh, and so, so we, we're just about ready to get that done, sign off on that. And they said within six months they should have everything in place to get started. So, so that is uh, on stream. The Sile Bay Resort development, I understand the principals out of Florida should be close to finalizing that MOU with the government. What yes, the Savannah Bay Development Project, I've seen the draft MOU, uh, certainly, uh, you know, we're working through um, a couple of little issues um, and that should be done shortly. Any other projects that the government has in, in, in its plans, uh, have been working on? Well, this project any, right here. Any the, more foreign direct investment? Well, the Sea Blue, um, you know, they actually are looking at the purchase and sale right now. Um, and that will, um, you know, they will expand this project. So we are working with them right now on a new um, MOU. We just, um, you know, agreed so to some duty-free concessions so that they can upgrade and also repair some of the, renovate some of the, the properties here. So that's uh, another one coming. Uh, rendezvous, I got a letter um, two weeks ago uh, from the funding agency said that um, they, they are almost uh, done with uh, procuring funding for that project, which will be a Waldorf Astoria um, hotel project, uh, luxury villas and a marina. Um, uh, what else uh, do we have? I'm thinking around the island because Keith, there's so many uh, you know, I get approached uh, by uh, many uh, potential investors and investors who want to expand their projects here. You know, Four Seasons with uh, that was recently uh, bought uh, by the DOT group out of the Cayman Islands uh, from Starwood Capital. They have an um, expansion uh, project that uh, we're working on the MOU with them right now. And, and so, so, yeah, so I, the potential for this country is great, Keith. And, and the confidence that investors and developers have in this administration. I mean, they voice it every time they see us. They said they've never met an administration who, um, who does not ask them um, for monies up front. And, and so that, that is a good thing. That way we can, you know, know that we go to work and um, we do an honest day's work and we get an honest day's pay and we are protecting and providing and looking out for the well-being of the people of England. The Aroa folks, I understand they are still uh, given some commitment or they're interested in helping this government with the airport extension project. Is that still in play? Um, don't have much details on that. I know in the MOU they had committed to $100,000 for um, enhancing the airport. They did put that into um, the airport enhancement that was done with the tower prior to American Airlines coming in. But I do know that, that all of the hotels, Keith, have voiced that they're interested in getting the runway expansion because they have seen the benefits of it. Their uh, hotel occupancy went up significantly with American Airlines coming. With um, the airline, um, Avianca was able to land here and um, bringing in that uh, big group that came in, that uh, you know the Sky High is able to bring in the E-190 plane. So, so, so they have seen it and they are on board with us to make sure that this happens. Uh, whether they help to fund it or we are allowed to get the funding, but they understand the economic impact of expanding the runway. Honorable Premier, certainly a, a, a program that we haven't heard much about. It was started by the, under the last administration, the Select Anguilla Reclusively Exclusive Residency Program. 
Can you tell us how is that going and the funding from that program, that high value resident would come here uh, as a way of helping to reduce their global tax liabilities and so on and so forth. The permanent residency status and so on. Keep that, 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 so. that program is still there. We call it the RBI, which is the Angular Residency, residency by Investment Program, or Select Angular. And this is marketed by Latitude and uh, another uh, company that does some of the uh, CIP programs, the Citizenship by Investment programs in some of the other countries. And um, it has been slow getting off. One of the, and you know how it works is if you want to come in and you invest 750,000 US dollars into Anguilla, um, you can get uh, residency by investment. Uh, or um, when we came in, we put in something called a retroactive uh, program that if you already had an investment that was 400,000 US dollars or more that you could get um, permanent residency. And then um, there's also now we've developed the Capital Development Fund, uh, but part of that program says if you invest 100 or you put in 150,000 US dollars into the Capital Development Fund, you could get tax residency. Now, what has been the problem is Anguilla does have issues with um, US corresponding banking. You know that um, NCBA has crown agents um, out of London, uh, Republic Bank does have, um, you know, with Bank of America. And so, so we've had issues with the persons that want to come getting the monies transferred into Anguilla. So we have found a way to work around that. And so that, uh, but we do have interest, significant interest in persons wanting to have residency by investment. Now you would think that uh, because they don't get a passport, that, that, but the thing about it is they like that you have the um, oversight of the UK. Um, in Anguilla, so uh, so they know that it's a stable country, and uh, politically and otherwise, and, and and so so we do have a lot of interest, and certainly um, most of the investors uh, who are here now, whether in the hotels or other investments, they are now um, inquiring as to how they can become part of the program, uh, you know, the residency by investment. What's the premier with the divestment of government shares? in the NCBA. I know there's a divestment committee in place as government moves to look at the assets liabilities and how they would move forward in divesting. Yes. It's 100% shareholding in the NCBA. Th that was the intention from the beginning. From the time that there was a banking resolution of 2016, it was determined that government should not own 100% shares in a bank. And so that was the goal set up by the previous administration, which has continued. And NCBA now has full commercial status, but Anguilla government is still the 100% shareholder. And the goal is that we would divest um, some of those shares uh, to... There's a lot of debt, uh, Keith, that was incurred. How much incurred. are you looking at divesting? How much? We, we haven't come to a, come an to agreement a... yet as to how much, what percentage of the shares we divest. I. There are some who feel that we should just divest the whole hundred percent. Um, I'm of the opinion that we need to retain a percentage How of much? the shares. Maybe twenty percent. Twenty percent or so, um, maybe thirty. And um, because I feel that once we get to the point of economic resilience in Anguilla, where the confidence in Anguilla is back to how it used to be, that Anguillians will want to have shares in the bank. Um, here, the, and, and so I, I feel we should retain some of those shares so that Anguillians, when they're ready, that they can uh, buy into the bank that is here in Anguilla. How about so government assisting young people, the, the, the younger generation, to be part of that shareholding stake by providing some, incentivizing, providing some means for them, because they won't have the necessary capital, but that's government's way of assisting its nationals. I'm, I'm looking at the young people, this younger generation, who haven't had a chance and who won't have the necessary the capital to do something like that. Is this something that you contemplate or you'll give me? I haven't thought about that, Keith. Uh, certainly, um, you know, depends on the fiscal position of the country. You can think about these things. I mean, right now the bank is giving 100% loans to young people to buy land, to build homes. Uh, you know, I think that those are good incentives. We also have the Angular Development Bank, which 
has um, low interest um, loans that uh, persons can get. And, you know, certainly, you know, we, we don't want to socialize the country, you know, where, where it seems government has given, given that. But I certainly, it, it's something that I can take into consideration, discuss um, with cabinet and see uh, what, what is thought about that. Um, you know, I, my gut feeling, though, is uh, that, that, that it doesn't seem fair. You know, but um, certainly it's something that um, can be considered, you know. Let's move to some issues of health, another part of your portfolio. Uh, Premier, a mole issue has developed at two places, uh, two government-related uh, government places, one Radio Anguilla and two the Health Authority. Are you aware of this? Has this been drawn to your attention and as Minister of Health? What can you do or what can your ministry do to alleviate this situation, a mole issue at those two places. Yeah, thank you, Keith, for that question. It's certainly uh, mm -hmm. when I hear about mold um, in commercial buildings, it's of concern because, you know, when I was in Florida as an ear, nose, and throat doctor, you get, you see patients who have, uh, you know, illnesses that are the result of mold um, exposure, and uh, you know, th there's some buildings that are called sick buildings because um, they they have mold and issues like that poor air circulation, and that can lead to upper respiratory and lower respiratory problems. So this was brought to my attention, and I have visited um, you know, the, um, you know, the clinic where the concern was. I went there with the facilities manager. We toured it. We saw uh, the issues. Um, you know, he has been doing some mitigation um, you know, solutions and not working fully. Uh, but I think he's working his um, his brain and his hands off to, and getting expert help from others to try to do that. But I asked him to give me a um, a full rundown of um, the situation, what he's done, and then um, we put our heads together and see what can be done to mitigate um, the mold issue. Um, in terms of Radio Anguilla, I know it's an old building. I know it's gotten wet many times uh, uh, through hurricanes and, and, and through uh, big rainstorms. And, and so that's something that we need to look at how we can do temporary um, control measures, uh, but then in the long run, you know, you need a new building. Right. Health Authority and that restructuring, bring it back on the government. Um, will it still have board of directors, EPS? Why, if you're bringing it back on the government, these are some of the issues. The other one is that as it relates to people not paying for services rendered by the, by the Health Authority for hospital services, some folks are saying it's bad now. What will be different under the ministry? Wouldn't it be worse? Because people will just take advantage. Well, government, it's a government as opposed to being now as a you know, semi-government institution. Those are just questions for you. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the payment system ain't gonna change much because you know government gives big subventions to health authority anyway. What I think is gonna be better management of it and better oversight. And I think with that will come uh, better techniques of um, how, how uh, persons uh, pay for the services that are provided. Certainly if uh, persons want a better quality care, they want um, expanded care such as specialist care, it has to be paid for. And so I'm pushing now for orthopedics, for cardiology, um, that we have the two surgeons that we've budgeted for. I mean, if we are providing this care that they run into the private sector and they have to pay for it. They run to St. Martin or they go elsewhere and they pay for it willingly. Why can't you pay for it if, it's, if I can guarantee that this is, um, you know, quality care? And, and that's, that's what I think we have to appeal to the people that if they want these services, it has to be paid for. Now, certainly, we will have in place um, health care for those 70 years and older. Uh, so that will help because a lot of the persons who can't pay are those who are not working. And, and, and if we can cover them uh, through this uh, program that we have, that will take out a lot of the arrears that we have of, of unpaid services. Because if you imagine an 80-year-old goes to the hospital, is in there for one to two weeks, they run up a bill of uh, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000, you know, they're not working, their family don't have it there really. And the, those are where the arrears come. They can go now to social development and do a means test uh, and see if they qualify for help. Um, but some people, you know, maybe, maybe it's pride, 
maybe they don't want to um, you know say what the assets are their bank accounts whatever um, you know I can understand these things and that's what happens but certainly I think that um, bringing it back under the um, the ministry is going to give us better oversight better administration and uh, better ability to account for the funding that is given um, to healthcare and right now um, over half of the um, the so the health care health authority budget is provided by government anyway in subventions and and so so I think government should better would be better able to manage that since you're already paying for it. Anyway. Well, what about the structure? So I was just going to get to that. Thank you for um, reminding me. Well, in structure. terms of the structure, now what we want to see, and this is not finalized. I do have a health um, reform board that is working on that. I have gotten an interim report of what they um, suggest as a structure, um, where we have, you know, the minister. You have a. Um, Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Health, you have a health commissioner that basically would oversee all the um, health care delivery services, uh, similar to like a CEO. And then you have, um, you know, the facilities, the hospital, the clinics, and uh, the community nursing, everything. The health commissioner would be responsible for oversight in that area and, and uh, you know, basically has to report to me as the Minister of Health or whoever is the next Minister of Health. Um, I hope it's me because I think that we have started a program of um, healthcare delivery in Anguilla which will ensure that um, the public provision of healthcare is going to be better than it's ever been. So with that health commissioner then you're going to have the staff will then also come in and right now Keith, you know, the staff will come in at the salaries uh, that they have, you know, although in the health authority the salaries are usually higher than what the public service um, salaries are. We will maintain that, um, you know, through a, I've discussed this with um, the Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of Health, to see how we can make that work. And, 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 and there are ways to do it. So, so we're not um, just going to say we bring it back and we haven't been working on the, the structure and the strategy. All of that is in play right now, Keith. And I think that we're going to have a better health care service. That's Premier, and I'll be very straight up. Folks, some folks are still saying, why does the Premier have to dismantle the Health Authority to get the powers that he needs as Minister of Health to do what he has to do? Can't he just take something to Parliament, make amendments to the Health Authority Act, and move forward? Again, I want you to explain this. I've asked you this before, but it, it, it's like a recurring decimal. I hear it from time to time from members of the public. It's been sent to me, folks have met me and have asked me the question. And I say I'll put it again.